Okay, let's open our Bibles to the book of Ezra, chapter 3. Ezra and chapter 3. We're going to get through or look at the first seven verses tonight. So let's read beginning at Ezra 3, verse 1, and we'll read down through verse 7. And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings there unto, excuse me, thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were con consecrated, and of every one that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters, and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and to them of Tyre, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa, according to to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. I want you to turn forward for a moment to the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. <clears throat> and let's read... Verses 8 through 13. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall, he looketh forth at the window, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Here, in Song of Solomon 2, in typology, the Lord gives us the date of the rapture or the time of the rapture, when the bridegroom comes to take away his beloved, uh, to elope with her, as it were. Uh, it's in the springtime. Uh, verse 11 says, For lo, the winter is past. And then verse 12, uh, The flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle, or the turtle dove, is heard in our land. Um, the major Jewish feast at that time of the year is Passover. Today is March the 28th, 2018. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Passover is supposed to begin this coming Saturday evening at sundown. You know, the way the Jews count days from sundown to sundown. I believe it's this weekend. Um... And uh, the, the time of the rapture is in the springtime. And uh, I think we're all ready to go if the Lord Jesus were to come back this year. Uh, and like I say, in typology, the, the bridegroom calling for his beloved to come away. Uh, and in our text tonight, here in Ezra chapter 3, God hints that his visible return to Jerusalem and the rebuilding of of the temple will be in connection with the Feast of Tabernacles, 
which occurs in the fall. Notice in Ezra 3, verse 4, They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required. And again, I'm going uh, by uh, typology and a preview, foreshadowing. The Jews, having, after having been um, scattered or taken to exile in Babylon, and the ten tribes of of the, the kingdom of Israel scattered before the tribes of Judah were scattered around uh, the, the world at that time. Uh, going back to Jerusalem with authority to rebuild their temple. And in type, it's a type of Christ coming back, setting up a throne in Jerusalem and a, and a temple being rebuilt for his sake. Uh, but there are a number of scripture verses that ought to point the Christian in that direction as the time of the year when Christ's visible return will take place, Revelation 19. Uh, let me have you run to a number of these passages with me. First of all, let's go to the book of Zechariah, near the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah and uh, chapter 14. Zechariah 14, uh, let's begin at verse 1. <clears throat> Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. Um, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove south, excuse me, remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Uh, jump down at verse, to verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, in that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. Verse 11. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem excuse me, Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Go down to verse 16. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that, that have no rain, there shall be pl the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. I go forward to the book of Matthew, chapter 17. <clears throat> Matthew, chapter 17. And let's start there with verse 1. Verses 1 through 4. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. The Feast of Tabernacles was a feast when the Jews would live outdoors, and they'd make temporary booths out of uh, tree branches and uh, sticks as they could assemble them together, and uh, to remind themselves of the wanderings uh, in the wilderness when they had a portable structure called the, called the tabernacle or the tent, um, which had to be put up and then taken down and put up and taken down every time the cloud moved and they had to follow but um, 
go, if you will, to the book of Acts chapter 15. And so the transfiguration there with Peter mentioning building three more tabernacles indicates what time of the year that that event occurred. The picture of Christ's second coming. Moses and Elijah appearing in connection with his visible glorious return as uh, prophesied in the very last verses of the book of Malachi. But Acts chapter 15, and notice one verse here, verse 16, well, verses 15 and 16. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. Now, I want you to go back to the book of Psalms, Psalm 19. I'll have you look at these, two, these next two texts um, with each other, Psalm 19 and also Malachi 4. I'll give you a chance to find both of those references, Psalm 19 and Malachi 4, the very last chapter in the Old Testament. Psalm 19 and Malachi 4. Psalm 19 and uh, verses 4 through 6. <clears throat> says, Their line, he's talking about the sun and nature and the heavens. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. The creation, the visible creation, is preaching a sermon to everyone that sees it. And their words to the end of the world, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, S-U-N, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Now look at Malachi 4. Malachi 4 in verses 1 and 2. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Well, the Son was said to be like a man uh, coming out of his tabernacle. And um, here, Christ coming back is likened to the sun, coming to burn up the wicked. Uh, and lastly, let's go back to Exodus 25. Exodus 25. That's in the Old Testament, right after the book of Exodus 24. Exodus 25, and verses 1 and 2, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. Recall how uh, it already told us in our text tonight, in Ezra 3, that uh, men offered willingly to do the work of rebuilding the altar and so forth. Verses 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. And I gave you all of those references to, to make the point that God seems to be hinting toward us, in, uh, hinting toward us uh, and um, indicating to us when his visible return and the setting up of his throne uh, once again here on, or on the earth uh, will take place. It will take place at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And that happens in the seventh month or happened in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. Now, in the old world calendar, September used to be the seventh month. And as a matter of fact, the word September means seven um, September, October, November, December mean seven, eight, nine, ten. 
And uh, sometime, I forget when they, when the, uh, probably the uh, Roman Empire or the influence of the popes in the 1500s decided to uh, start the year in January rather than where it had begun before in around the time of March. <clears throat> but uh, those four names of those months still indicate the old way they used to count it. Today, September is the ninth month on our calendar, but the name September means seven, not nine. And, uh, and so when I say uh, the time of September, I'm, I'm approximating the time of the year to match the seventh month in the Hebrew calendar, or roughly when the Jews observe the Feast of Tabernacles. The Jews' 360-day calendar is not in perfect alignment with our 365-day calendar. And so that's why their feasts uh, vary on the date uh, from year to year. Uh, by the way, how many know the way Easter is dated? In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus died on the Passover and then rose again after three days and three nights, um, you would think that Easter would follow Passover, three days after Passover every year, but it does not. Uh, Easter is dated the first Sunday following the first full moon of springtime. So springtime started last, was it the 22nd? 21st or 22nd of March, and we've had one full moon since then, and this is the first Sunday following that first full moon. It has to do with the planets and uh, more, is more connected with uh, planet and idolatry worship than it is following the Jewish custom of Passover. But uh, be that as it is, uh, this is merely what we just looked at. It was simply comparing Scripture with Scripture. And a Bible believer b believes that every word has some significance. And so we don't change the words in the Bible. Wherever the word tabernacle is found, we should be able to find some common ground between all of them indicating something to us. And that would indicate the time of the year when Christ's visible, glorious return will take place at the end of the tribulation. Um, at Christmas time, we have taught repeatedly that Christ was not born in December, but rather September. And I'm like, again, I, again, I say I'm approximating it um, for our understanding. The seventh month of the old world calendar. Luke 3, verse 23 says that at his baptism, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Well, when his ministry started after that baptism, it went from, if, if he was born in September, then it went from September to September, and then to the next September, and the next September, three years, and then six months or uh, half of a year later, and that would make his public ministry three and a half years ending at the time of the Passover. And uh, all one needs to do is count the four Passovers that Jesus observed during his public ministry. They are listed in the book of, in the Gospel of John. And I was going to write the references down, but I, I didn't do so. <clears throat> you can see me later if you want to know them. But um, making his public ministry, uh, starting at his baptism, uh, three and a half years, and his total life, 33 and a half years. So all someone has to do is start at the time of his crucifixion and count backwards 33 and a half years and you'll put the time of his birth uh, at the month of September. Uh, Luke 2 verse 8 says they were in the same country shepherds abiding in their fields keeping watch over their flocks by night. Well, no shepherds are still sleeping outdoors with the flocks in December. It's too cold. Their climate is almost like ours here in Southern California. We're right about 30, between 30 and 35 degrees latitude, just as uh, the state of Israel is, and they're right on the, on the water just as Southern California is with the Pacific Ocean. And their climate is not terribly unlike ours. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, I suppose, depending on which month it is and how cold the weather gets, there's occasionally snow on the hilltops, so you could theoretically go play in the snow in the morning in Israel and then drive down to the coast and go to the beach in the afternoon, which is what you can do here in Southern California, <laughs> depending on the month and the, and the conditions. And in December, nobody would be sleeping outdoors here in California, nor were they sleeping outdoors with the flocks in Israel. By that time of the year, they've already got the flocks and the sheep uh, into the barns or into the corrals. They're no longer out grazing. <clears throat> the human body is likened to a tabernacle. The tabernacle was a temporary structure, and uh, Peter says, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Second Peter one fourteen. And the Bible says, John one fourteen, the word Christ was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so his birth, the time he took on human flesh, came around this month of September, approximately the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And his second advent will come to the world at that time if the scriptures are indicating to us anything accurate, and I believe they, they are. And um, there are several names mentioned in verse 2 of our text tonight. Jeshua, which is another spelling of Joshua, which is interesting that, that Joshua or Jeshua would be the first name mentioned in connection with the Jews returning and getting ready to rebuild and beginning to offer sacrifice and offering once again. That was Jesus' name. Jesus, simply the <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, a Greek Greekified variation of Joshua means the salvation of the Lord or Jehovah saves. But uh, Joshua the son of Josedach. Uh Go, if you will, back to First Chronicles chapter 6. First Chronicles chapter 6. I'll give you a moment to find that. First Chronicles 6. And notice there verses 14 and 15. First Chronicles 6, verses 14 and 15. And Azariah begat Sarayah, and Sarayah begat Jehozadak. That's going to be Josadak, as it's spelled here in Ezra 3. And uh, his father, Josedek, uh or the father of Jeshua. So, so that would make Sarayah, uh, verse 14, the grandfather of Jeshua that we just read in Ezra 3. Uh, his father, Josedek probably died in Babylon. And then in our text, verse 2, it mentions Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel means a descendant, or rather a, um, a descendant of Babylon, or one coming from Babylon. And he comes back to also lead the organizing of the rebuilding of the temple, um, which they haven't got to yet, and the, the reinstituting of the sacrifices. Uh, yeah, I was going to have you look at a scripture that mentions his father. Yeah, it's not necessary. First Chronicles 3, and you don't need to turn, but First Chronicles 3, verses 17 to 19, give us the name of Pedaiah, who was said to be the father of Zerubbabel. Um, so while Pedaiah 
uh, fathered him, uh, his fa- the one who raised him was named Shealtiel, here in Ezra 3, verse 2, however the events transpired. Uh, notice that although the, in our text, notice that although the temple here is nowhere near completion, uh, they all see the need of restoring the Mosaic and the Levitical laws of sacrifice first before the tabernacle or the new temple is set up. Uh, so they rebuild the altar, and the, according to verse 3, and set the altar upon his bases. There's Old Testament precedent for that. As far back as Exodus 20, verse 24, God gives them instructions for the altar of sacrifice long before there was any mention of the tabernacle, which they would construct and put together and uh, raise up and then tear down and raise up and tear down every time the flaming fire or the cloud, the pillar of a cloud, uh, lifted up away from it. Notice uh, in our text tonight, verse 7, once again, they gave money also unto the masons. Those weren't uh, free and accepted masons. Those weren't Scottish Rite or York Rite. Um, those were actual stone masons. In fact, I would, I would wonder how many members of the Masonic Lodge have ever picked up a trowel and know anything about laying brick. Probably many of them have never done so. My dad knows how to, but he's not even a mason. So, yeah, it says uh, the masons and to the carpenters. That wasn't Richard and Karen Carpenter, the singing the brother and sister. And meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon, uh, sometimes spelled Sidon, S-I-D-O-N, and to them of Tyre. Tyre and Sidon, just to the north of Israel, were about nine miles from each other. Um, also referred to, or actually they were also considered Phoenicians in Bible days. Uh, to, the sea, uh, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. So not only did Cyrus authorize them to go and rebuild their temple, rebuild their city and return to their own homeland, but he also authorized and made promise and provision for supplies to be provided to the Jews to carry it out, to bring it to pass. Evidently, Tyre and Sidon were uh, well-known places to obtain cedar and wood for building. Solomon obtained cedar from them many, many generations before for the building of his temple in his day. Now, the men of Zidon, who were there, uh, eventually caused trouble to the Jew. Go forward just for a moment, and I'm going to be finishing just in a minute, a few minutes early. But Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah 13, or not Sidon, but the city of Tyre, Nehemiah 13 and verse 16 says, There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Uh, Then I contended, this is Nehemiah speaking, Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do, and profane the Sabbath day? So the men of Tyre, perhaps the men of Sidon as well, but the men of Tyre, uh, specifically, begin to uh, co- help the Jews corrupt themselves by transacting business on the Sabbath day, uh, knowing full well, having enough time to have learned full well that that's not to be done, and not to profane the Sabbath day. That's a day of rest uh, 